Hi everyone, in this video I'll talk about caching basics and how to implement in-memory caching to improve performance and response speed in ASP.NET Core Web API applications. Caching is the technique of storing frequently accessed data at a temporary location for quicker access in the future. This can significantly improve the performance of an application by reducing the time required for connecting with the data source and sending data across the network. And one type of caching available in .NET apps is in-memory caching. It is the simplest form of cache in which the application stores data in the memory of the web server. This is based on the iMemory cache interface, which represents a cache object stored in the application's memory. Since the application maintains an in-memory cache on the server memory, if we want to run the app on multiple servers, we should ensure sessions are sticky. A sticky session is a mechanism in which we make all the requests from a client go to the same server. Now, let's see how we can implement in-memory caching in an ASP.NET Core application. I already have the solution prepared, and as you can see, I will use a repository pattern to fetch the data from the database. And in the context file, I apply the configuration for data seeding. With the migration files in place, all I have to do is to update my database with the update database command. And as you can see, my database is created and the data is seeded. Now, just quickly, I would like to let you know about our Ultimate ASP.NET Core Web API book, which you can find linked in the description below. Feel free to check out the book or a Blazor course if you want to master all the best practices to create powerful production-ready web APIs and client C-sharp apps without using JavaScript. Again, the links are in the description below. Now, to continue, I also have the controller prepared to fetch and create new entries and this is the class where all the caching logic will be implemented. Of course, you can create a service and add the caching logic there. But for the sake of simplicity of this video, I will do it inside the controller. So, once the API is ready, let's modify the controller and add the caching support to it. Let's first start with the additional fields and constructor modifications. So, since I don't want to repeat the name of the cache entry each time, I will create a new constant string field here and add the value of employee list. Also, to be able to use the in-memory caching, I need to inject the iMemory cache interface. So, let's add a new private iMemory cache field and name it cache. Also, inside the constructor, I have to provide a new parameter of the same type, name it cache, and initialize the field. Now, with the caching service injected, I can modify the get action. So, I will first check if I already have the cache entry stored. And I can do that by using the cache field and the try get value method where I will pass the name of the entry I am searching for and the out local variable of the ienumerable employee type named employees. This is where I want to store the return the result from the cache, if I find it, of course. If I really find it, I will simply log the information for us to see the flow inside the console, with a simple message that I found employees inside the cache. On the other hand, I will again use the logger to log the information that I didn't find employees in cache. Also, let's use the existing code and paste it here and just remove the var keyword. Now, I have the employee list in the employees variable and I'm ready to add it to the cache entry. But before I do that, it's always a good practice to create some caching options before the caching itself. So, let's create a new cache entry options variable and instantiate it with the memory cache entry options class. At this point, I can use different chainable methods to create my cache options. That said, I will first use the set sliding expiration method and set the value of the 60 seconds for the expiration. 
This determines how long a cache entry can be inactive before it is removed from the cache. It is a good practice to set a lower value, like 1 minute or so. Then, I will call the set absolute expiration method and set the argument to 1 hour. The problem with sliding expiration is that if we keep on accessing the cache entry, it will never expire. On the other hand, absolute expiration solves this by making sure that the cache entry expires by an absolute time irrespective of whether it is still active or not. It is good practice to set this to a higher value, like 1 hour or so. Also, a good caching strategy is to use a combination of sliding and absolute expiration. Lastly, I want to call the set priority method and set it to cache item priority dot normal. This sets the priority of the cached object. By default, the priority will be normal, but we can set it to low, high, never remove, etc. Depending on what priority we need to assign to the cache. As the server tries to free up the memory, the priority that we set for the cache item will determine if it will be removed from the cache. Great! Now that I have the options ready, I can use the cache field and call the set method to create the cache entry. And pass the name of the entry, the value, and the options I just created. Now, I have to register the caching inside the program class. And for that, I will simply use the builder.services property and call the add memory cache method. Now, it is important to note that for most types of apps templates in .NET, iMemory cache is enabled out of the box. For example, if you are calling add MVC or add controllers with views or add razor pages, etc., it enables the iMemory cache. But in the case of the web API application, we have to call it explicitly. Great, now I can test this. Let's run the app and use the Postman request to test the caching mechanism. And we get the data from the database, as we can see by inspecting the console log. But let's send the request one more time before one minute expires. And we get the same result and it took a lot less time to do so. And of course, if you look at the logs, you see we fetch this one from the cache. Awesome! Of course, once the minute passes and I try to fetch the result one more time, you can see the longer time needed for the result to be returned and also in the logs, you can see the message. Great! Now let's talk about setting a size limit on a memory cache. While using a memory cache instance, there is an option to specify a size limit. The cache size limit does not have a defined unit, but it represents the number of cache entries that the cache can hold. Even though specifying a size limit for the memory cache is completely optional, once we set a size limit for the cache in the options, we must specify a size for all cache entries. Similarly, if no cache size limit is set, the size set on individual cache entries will be ignored. So, to specify the size limit for the in-memory cache, I can simply modify the add memory cache method in the program class. I can extend the method with additional action delegate and use the options to call the size limit property and let's set it to 1024. Now, while creating individual cache entries, we must specify a limit, or else it will throw an exception. Well, let's check that first without the size set on an entry. And send the request. And as you can see, the error clearly states that we must have a cache entry with a specified size. So, let's add it. We can add it by calling the setSize method and providing the value of 1. We can create cache entries in different sizes, but once the sum of all entries reaches the size limit set in the program class, it cannot insert any more entries. For instance, in this example, we could create 1024 entries with a size of 1, 512 with size 2, etc. 
The idea is that we can design different cache entries by giving different sizes depending on the application's requirements. Now, an interesting thing to note here is that once the cache reaches its limit, it does not remove the oldest entry to make room for new entries. Instead, it will just ignore the new entries and the cache insert operation will not throw an error as well. Again, let's see this in practice. First, I will set the size limit to just a single entry. Now with this done, let's add one more cache entry inside the action. But this time I will use a different name. Also, I will modify the name inside the condition. Also, I will simply add a few breakpoints here. And now I can run the app and send the request. You can see the value is zero for the size and the count. Now, since I have nothing cached, I will get the data from the database and then cache it. But as you can see, I will cache one more entry. But after the second entry, we still see just one for the size and the count. Now let's finish the request and send another one. You can see the count is one, but I don't have the second key entry cached, just the first one. So again, I am fetching the data from the database. But this time, after I reach the first set line, the cache count will be zero. And then I will cache the second entry. Finally, I can send one more request and this time I have the second entry. Excellent! You now see how the size affects the caching entries in our app. With this done, I will simply return the code to what it was previously and also remove these breakpoints. Now we know how to add cache, but what about removing data from in-memory cache? Well, the .NET Core runtime will remove the in-memory cache items automatically in certain scenarios. When the application server is running short of memory, the .NET Core runtime will initiate the cleanup of in-memory cache items other than the ones set with never remove priority. Also, once we set the sliding expiration, the inactive entries will expire at that time. Similarly, once we set the absolute expiration, all entries will expire by that time. Also, as you saw, if we try to add the cache entry with the same key, the cache will be removed. Apart from this, there is an option to manually remove an item from the in-memory cache. For instance, in our example, we might want to manually invalidate the cache when the new employee record is inserted into the database. I can use the remove method of the iMemoryCache interface to do that in the post method. This will remove the employee list from the cache when the new employee is inserted into the database. Now, let's talk about managing concurrent access to in-memory cache. Let's assume that multiple users try to access the data from in-memory cache at the same time. Even though iMemory cache is thread safe, it is prone to raise conditions. For instance, if the cache is empty and two users try to access the data at the same time, there is a chance that both users may fetch the data from the database and populate the cache. Well, this is not desirable. To solve these kinds of issues, we need to implement a locking mechanism for the cache. To implement locking for the cache, I can use the semaphore slim class, which is a lightweight version of the semaphore class. This will help me control the number of threads that can access a resource concurrently. To do that, let's declare a private static read-only semaphore slim field named semaphore and instantiate it with the new semaphore slim class. Now, let's modify the get action to implement the locking of the cache. So, I will add a try finally block inside the else part. And the first thing I will do is to wait the semaphore.wait async method. Calling wait async on the semaphore produces a task that will be completed when that thread has been given access to that task. Then I can copy the previous if condition, 
paste it here and just remove the type because I already have it from the above statement. So once the thread enters the sample, it checks if the cache entry is populated by other threads by that time. If the entry is still not available in the cache, let's create an else block and proceed to fetch the data from the database and populate it into the cache. Finally, it's very important to make sure that we release the sample so that other threads can continue. Awesome. With this, we are managing concurrent access to this cache. So, we have seen how in-memory caching improves the performance of data access. However, it has some limitations as well that we need to be aware of. Let's take a look at some of the pros and cons of in-memory caching. When we access data from the cache, it will be very fast as no additional network communication is involved outside of the application. Also, in-memory cache is considered highly reliable as it resides within the app server's memory. The cache will work fine as long as the application is running. Additionally, implementing an in-memory cache is very easy with a few simple steps without any additional infrastructure or third-party components and hence it is a good option for small to mid-scale apps. Of course, for the cons, for large-scale apps running on multiple application servers, there will be an overhead to maintain sticky sessions. And if not properly configured, it may consume a lot of the app server's resources, especially memory. Great! With all the knowledge about in memory caching in our minds, I will finish the video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again in another one. Until then, all the best.